Hey everybody, welcome back to the clinicaltrialsguru.com. Again, that website address is www.theclinicaltrialsguru.com. It's been about a week or two since I've done my last video, and today I just wanted to get into some quick uh, audience member questions, and I'll just go through in order, and uh, we'll see how far we get. Okay, so the first one is. And by the way, for those of you who it is your first time watching, uh, welcome to the clinicaltrialsguru.com, the place where I believe I believe the best place in the entire internet for clinical trial content and information. And uh, I do YouTube videos, I do podcasts, written blog posts, whatever it may be. So today I am shooting live actually from one of my undisclosed clinical trial guru locations and I had a couple of minutes to get into some of these questions because I am a little bit behind so let's get right into it the first one and by the way if you want to send your questions submit your questions you will remain anonymous it's dan at the clinical trials guru.com this one says hi dan I would like to ask you about satellite sites uh, I've been searching information about satellite sites especially on FDA regulations and I discovered almost nothing. I'm from Spain, and here we don't use these types of sites, but I'd like to learn more about them. Can you please help me and give me some ideas about FDA regulations, criteria to establish a satellite site, and how the relation between the main center and the satellite site is? So yeah, unfortunately, you will not find very much published on this. In fact, very little, which is why I think it's important that... Uh, we have something, at least somebody talking about this kind of stuff. So it's surprisingly very easy to set up a satellite site. You're talking to someone who's done this several times. I'm always adding another site somewhere uh, in the world. And uh, basically, the way the FDA looks at it is the FDA looks at a satellite site as no different than just PI oversight. So you, it's actually surprisingly simple to have a satellite site. All you need to do is get sponsor permission on a study-by-study -study basis. So let's say I'm doing a study with Pfizer at a site in Anaheim, California. Okay, and I'm I want to do the same study for the same P, with the same PI at a different uh, site. So let's say I want to do it the same study at Anaheim, but also in uh, Norwalk, California, which is about 30 minutes away. The two sites are about 30 minutes apart. Same PI. Um, I would just need sponsor permission for them to give me the approval to use two sites using the same PI. And then on the 1572 form, you have to add the second location. The FDA looks at this no differently than just having one site. The way they see it is that the PI, it's the PI or the principal investigator's responsibility to have adequate oversight at each clinic. So whether it's at one site, two sites, three sites, it doesn't matter. Now there's another way to do satellite site, which is to have a different PI. So let's say the same situation I just described. I have a study with Pfizer. I'm doing it at Anaheim with one PI. Now I want to do it at Norwalk with another PI. Technically this, a lot of people refer to it as a satellite site, but technically this would not be a satellite site. This would be a separate site. Even though I own the company that owns both sites, if I'm using different PI at each location, it's not considered a satellite site. And the way the FDA looks at it, and any sponsor would look at it, is two separate research clinics even though you may be using one contract and budget because it's the same company you would need one 1572 for each site with each site location and each PI signing the 1572 basically signing and acknowledging that they have to have adequate oversight for uh, their site so there's two ways to go about doing a satellite site one way is to have two locations with the same PI. The other way is to have two locations with a different PI. 
it's not going to be any different in Spain or in Anaheim. It doesn't matter where you are. Hopefully this helps. Uh, let's go through some more questions. Here's one I thought was good. Um, hi, Dan. I'm a big fan. Please keep up the good work. I have 98 questions, but I spare you the one I have right now. Does all material seen by a patient need to be approved by the IRB? What if it is not study specific? I'm specifically referring to website content that is not specific to a study and just talks about diseases we conduct the research on. Um, so we just tell you what clinical research is and we talk about diseases that we conduct research on. So with the exception of those of you who are under the jurisdiction of a local IRB, most sites, and I recommend if you have any choice in the matter, uh, you will use a central IRB. And in those cases, the central IRB, and there, there's gray areas everywhere, so don't just take what I'm gonna, about to tell you as uh, um, legal advice by any stretch of the imagination, but use common sense. If you're having any type of content, whether it's an ad, whether it's a blog post, whether it's something in the newspaper, whether it's a poster that you're putting somewhere in the community, if you're recruiting specifically for a particular study, you need IRB approval from the central IRB of that study. Now, if you're, if you're talking about asthma in general, or a disease in general, or diabetes in general, or schizophrenia in general, and you say at the end of that piece of content or that ad, please contact us at such and such clinical research for more information on this topic and some of the programs we may have. You don't necessarily need IRB approval for that. Now, again, be very careful with how far you stretch this because there is a fine line somewhere between information and advertisement. As long as you don't cross that line, and if you ask legal advice, they're going to tell you to get everything run through your IRB. You can do that. It's going to take longer. You don't always need to do that. A lot of times I think that's overkill. Um, for example, we do a lot of schizophrenia studies. So if I were to do a blog post on schizophrenia without mentioning any specific details of any study, and at the end I say, hey, we conduct research on schizophrenia. We've been doing this since 2002. Give us a call to learn more about schizophrenia and some of the programs or the research studies we may have for you. That does not necessarily require IRB approval. So just something to keep in mind. And there is a fine line. Of course, everything I just told you does not apply if you have a local IRB and a lot of the research clinics that uh, operate within a hospital or from an academic institution have your own IRBs and they'll be watching what you're putting out. So in those cases, you need to run everything, everything. And whenever you're in doubt, run it through your IRB or get some legal representation. I should have Darshan Kulkarni, one of our clinical trial group producers on the show, uh, pretty soon. It's been a while since we've done a interview, and I'll ask him the same question, but that's always been my opinion on this. Uh, here's another one. Uh, says, hi, Dan. Thank you for your work on the blog. My question is about internship. I'm doing a training certificate um, in clinical research at a, at a university. I will not mention it. And I need to do an internship in June, July. Uh, the thing is, I do not know where to look for it. I need some of your brilliant ideas. And when it comes down to doing something like this, it's less about having a brilliant idea and more about just hustle. I think hustle is very underrated. You're going to need to be going out to like 100 places and apply. And that's my brilliant idea. My brilliant idea is to work your ass off and uh, go to 100 places, 200 places, as many as it takes until you get an internship. There's just uh, nothing else I can advise you. Maybe, maybe, because I'm such a big fan of this idea, but it's definitely not a replacement for just hustling and working your, your ass off 
and applying it a bunch of places until you do get him is maybe having a blog um, and someplace that you can demonstrate that you're passionate about this stuff. But that's maybe, but not a substitute for just going to 100 different places and applying. <clears throat> not a substitute in addition to it, okay? Hopefully that helps. Email me if you still have questions. I apologize for not having a n more brilliant ideas than that. I mean, it's just sometimes you just got to roll up your sleeves and get out there and hustle. Here's another one. I'm a foreign medical doctor and I want to go into research, into research associate jobs, so a CRA or a monitor, but I don't know how to start and how to prepare myself uh, before I start sending my resume. The experience I had about research was during medical school. Please do advise me on how to go about it. I hate to promote my own products. Well, I take that back. I don't hate it. Um, go to my blog for $19.99. That's 20 bucks. You can buy my Introduction to Clinical Research DVD. It's basically a crash course or a Cliff Notes version of everything you need to know about research. I made it affordable for you guys um, so that you can just get it. It's quick. It's mailed to you. You'll get it in a few days. 20 bucks. It's two hours long. Uh, they have bonus DVDs on there too with all the interviews. So when you add it all up, it's probably about 10 hours. But the crash course is about two hours. Watch that. I've had people who have emailed me that after they've watched that, their confidence has been high as far as their knowledge of clinical research, and they're able to do well in job interviews. That's my advice, and that's why I have the DVD. So check it out. Uh, actually, a good way to end it is to do a little testimonial on this very topic while keeping the person's name anonymous. So, hi hey Dan, I just wanted to send you an email letting you know that I have a telephone interview with a CRO for a clinical trial associate position. So this is exactly what the previous viewer wanted to do. Thanks for all your commitment to those of us in clinical research, your continued support, um, blogs, podcasts, and emails and tweets are greatly appreciated. Uh, these blogs, podcasts, books, and DVDs have allowed me to expand my skill set beyond my current job title and also gave me the confidence to apply for this position. The book this person is referring to is uh, the Clinical Research Coordinator Survival uh, Guide. It's on Amazon for $2.99, so if the $20 DVD is too expensive, go on Amazon and get the $2.99 Kindle book the Clinical Research Coordinator Survival Guide. Um, let's see if there's any more questions. There was a lot of them lately, and uh, I'll probably get to one more before it's all said and done. Oh, okay, here's the last one. In your opinion, how much do you think a clinical research coordinator with a master's degree and eight years of research experience should make? I've seen anything from 16 to 25 an hour, but sometimes feel undervalued. Thanks for your input. So in my experience, someone with a master's degree and eight years of experience in research as a clinical research coordinator should make around $60,000. And I think that works out to right around $20 an hour. I'm not doing, I'm just doing quick math in my head. So hopefully that helps. A lot of times you'll, you'll rarely see hourly rates being paid to research coordinators. You're going to see salary because, as you know, this is not necessarily a 9-to-5 job. You may need to stay late. You may need to come early. Monitors may need to stay later. You need to accommodate them as a coordinator. Patients may need to come earlier or on the weekends. You need to accommodate them as a coordinator. So many companies opt for salaries so that they can't necessarily specify job hours, but they specify job duties. So hopefully that helps. Um, I know it's very, very easy to feel undervalued as a study coordinator. I get it. I used to be one. I hire coordinators. I understand it's just the way it is, but usually you're going to be salary paid and not hourly. I want to thank the, my, the following clinical trial guru producers. 
uh, Sarah Elizabeth Siegler, Resolve Research Solutions, Accurate Clinical Trials, Erdhart Clinical Trials, PTNR, Patrick Stone, Darshan Kulkarni, Biofarm Systems, Simewire, Mozio, South Coast Clinical Trials, Breakthrough Clinical Trials, St. Paul Medical Research Center, Investigator Research Group, and Phlebotomy Services. And if you're interested in becoming a clinical trial group producer, after I get 100 producers, that's it. No more. But the cost is $99. One time, you get a lifetime membership. Email me, dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com for more info. It's very easy. And I'm accepting probably uh, about 80 more, maybe a little under 80. All right. Thank you guys for listening, for watching, however it is you like to consume this content. And until next time, stay tuned to dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Take care.